Hi, I'm Alex Udris, and thanks for joining us tonight on Bold Method Live VFR, where we're talking about forces in a turn. I know this is a pretty fundamental topic. It's something that we learn about, hopefully in our private pilot training, uh, but we don't always learn about it in depth. And then it's not necessarily covered because it's just kind of a given as we move on into our more senior flight courses. And it's a very important concept because turning relates to load factor, load factor relates to stall speed, and an uncoordinated turn, when you start talking about slips and skids, those really start to relate to spins. And obviously, it's an incredibly common flight maneuver. We're doing it all the time, low and high, critical flight scenarios and in crews. So tonight, we're gonna take a look at the aerodynamics behind a turn and how an aircraft flies through a turn. We're gonna talk about some overbanking tendencies and your control inputs during a turn. Then we're gonna talk about skids and slips and the difference between those two items and a coordinated turn. We're gonna talk about their effects on the aircraft's performance in a stall and why you should keep an aircraft in a coordinated turn at all times. And we're gonna talk about some real flight scenarios where you could get yourself into a skid or a slip, both unintentionally and possibly, in the slip's case, intentionally. Corey Komarek is working the chat tonight, he's moderating. So, as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, if you want me to go into more detail, throw it out right away in chat. Corey will grab it and move it over to Colin Cutler, who's our technical director tonight. He'll get it up on the screen. Don't wait till the end. Throw out questions as we're moving through, and then I'll be pausing and grabbing those. Makes this a much more interactive presentation. Okay, with that, we'll get started with the basic concept of a turn. And before we go to the iPad, I'm actually just going to start with a basic metal airplane here in UND Green. And I'm gonna show you a couple different concepts. When we think about turning, we're really talking about a combination of forces that propel the airplane kind of tangentially around a circle. And when I say tangentially, I mean, think about an old, uh, if you ever had an RC airplane on a string, not you know one with a control stick, but just on a string, little gas powered, electric powered airplane, and you just sit there and move around in a circle, and that would pivot right on you. If you think about that, that airplane's longitudinal axis is basically tangential. It's just touching that circle, and it's moving around the circle as it's banked inward. That's a turn. It's easy to start to con con confuse that with the concepts of yaw and roll, which play an important part in turns, but they're not the right way to turn the airplane themselves. So when we think about yaw, if you stick a, a stick right through the, the vertical part of an airplane, this is yaw right here. And typically what we say is we control yaw with the rudder. Rudder makes the aircraft yaw. And that's true. Rudder is the primary way to control yaw on an airplane. Okay, if we stick a stick through the engine and out the tail, now we have roll, right? We can also call this bank. And traditionally we say the ailerons are what causes and controls the aircraft's ability to roll and bank. That's absolutely true. In reality, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. And if you've ever been flying before, I'm sure you've seen this. One of those things is you could step on that rudder and if you push the rudder to the left, you'll notice the airplane starts yawing to the left, but at the same time, it'll start rolling to the left. In fact, you probably noticed that during a stall or in turbulence, you can actually use yaw or the rudder to lift a wing. And when you start to look at the forces acting on the airplane and the control inputs, you realize things are a lot more complicated than just using ailerons to control bank and rudder to control your yaw, because it's hard to see that. Um, and, and, that's, and the two really start to tie in. So as we go through the turn, we're gonna start by assuming that the aircraft is in a coordinated turn. And so in this case, we're going to set the bank with the ailerons and then keep the nose pointed into the relative wind, controlling the yaw with the rudder, okay? So one of the questions would be, why would we even need rudder? Well, as we start to roll into that bank, we have a down aileron. And that down aileron is going to generate drag which starts to pull the nose outside of the turn. And so what we're going to need is a little bit of rudder to the inside of the turn. We're using rudder to keep the airplane from yawing away from the relative wind. 
And so that's what you should think of the rudder as. The rudder is basically keeping the nose of the airplane pointed in the relative wind. If you've ever flown a glider, you've probably seen a yaw string. And essentially, they just tape or glue a piece of yarn to the center of the windscreen. And as long as that string is pointing straight back, you know the aircraft is perfectly coordinated. Okay? If you were to push rudder one way or the other, you would see the, the string move. And it is the most simple kind of a turn coordinator. Now, if we go to the iPad, you'll see something that is familiar to most of us. Um, if you look on the right side here, it's an old turn coordinator. And we've replaced that yaw string with just a little ball. And essentially, as long as the downward force, uh, the, compo the combination of both gravity, and then you could say centrifugal or centrifugal force, which is not really a real force, uh, but we're gonna use it as an example here. As long as that is perfectly coordinated, that ball will stay in the center. But if it gets uncoordinated, you'll, coordinated, you'll see that ball start to slide out to one of the two sides. And that's where you come into the term, step on the ball. Now, one of the things that can be very difficult, if you're learning to fly in a modern airplane, we've got a lot of things that we put on the airplane to try to minimize the amount of adverse yaw as we roll into a turn. So if you're flying an old airplane, something from the 40s or the 30s, you might find that you need quite a bit of rudder because the aircraft weren't quite so advanced. If you're flying a newer aircraft, a, one, a newer 172, a Cirrus, and I mean, newer could even be in the 60s, 70s, and later. You have differential ailerons. You've got a lot of different technology that basically generates drag on those ailerons to try to counter that adverse yaw. And so one of the things that people think about is they go, you know, I really don't feel like I need a lot of rudder when I'm turning the airplane. And that could be very true. In some airplanes, you'll find the rudder pressure is incredibly slight. In other aircraft, you could find that you need quite a bit of rudder pressure. And so one of the things that you want to develop is the ability to feel the airplane when it's flying straight into the relative wind, to be able to feel the forces acting on both the airplane and the seat of your pants. And one of the easiest ways to do this is to start out in level flight and just simply apply a little rudder in either direction, not full force, just a little bit, and feel how that starts to push you around in the cockpit. Same thing, roll into a turn in a 20 degree bank angle turn well above stall speed and just uncoordinate the airplane a little bit and see how that makes you feel. Obviously in a glass cockpit airplane, you've got the, the turn coordinator indicator. indicator. You, um, if on most other aircraft, you've got a turn coordinator and a ball. But the reality is if you learn to feel where that ball is, it makes controlling the turn a lot easier. Okay, so going back to the iPad, let's take a look at the forces that are happening when we're keeping the aircraft coordinated in a turn. So what we've got here is an airplane in straight and level flight. And there are a couple forces. We have a vertical component, lift, acting straight up. And we have our vertical component, gravity, acting straight down. And these are black because ideally, in a turn, the vertical component shouldn't change and gravity is not going to change because we're not adding any weight or removing weight from the airplane in a turn. So we need to keep these two the same. So how do we get the airplane to go around in that circle? Well, the answer is we start to generate some sideways lift. And I'm going to pull this out all the way so you can clearly see this. This right there is our sideways lift, okay? And that is what's causing the aircraft to turn. So when we talk about sideways lift, you can really look at total lift right here. The interesting thing about total lift is that it is always perpendicular to the wings, okay? So if we look at total lift, it's pointing out in this direction. But of course, now we've got to break it into components so that we can compare it to things like gravity. And so one component is this vertical component of lift. And you can see that throughout the turn, we want this to stay the same. Otherwise, we're gonna to start to climb or descend as we accelerate or decelerate vertically. Okay, and then you've got the horizontal component of lift. That's what's making the aircraft turn. Again, gravity stays the same, 
This is what we like to call our load factor. It's what you feel in the seat pulling down against you. And this right here, you could call it centripetal force. A lot of physicists would throw a fit about that. It's really uh, radial acceleration that's pulling, the, that's opposing the aircraft's change in direction. But it is the balancing, I wouldn't, it's not technically a force, but you can think of it as a balancing force, balancing the horizontal component of lift. So as we bank, essentially the, the smaller bank, the less horizontal component of the lift, and this is our rate of turn indicator, the smaller the turn rate is. So as I start to increase our bank angle, you'll see that my turn indicator shows that the aircraft is turning faster. It's turning faster because we're generating more horizontal component of lift. The other thing you're gonna notice is that our G's start to increase. We're gonna talk about that more in a second. But as we're rolling into a turn and as we're generating both vertical and horizontal lift, that means that our total lift is increasing. That means that our angle of attack is increasing. If our total lift is increasing, then the load factor or the force we feel balancing us out is also increasing. And we call that G's, right? One would be our normal weight. And if we take it all the way to two, that would be two times our normal weight. So the way to think about that is if we're generating two Gs, we're generating twice the amount of lift we would do in normal straight and level on accelerated flight. And one of the interesting things we talk about that on accelerated flight should always be one G. So when you think about a turn, that means that we must be accelerating. And we are. Even though our airspeed isn't changing, the aircraft is accelerating, it's turning it's changing its velocity because velocity is both a speed and a direction. So when we talk about centripetal force and I say that's really radial acceleration, that's what I mean. The airplane is accelerating because it's changing its velocity. It's changing the directional component of velocity. The speed might stay the same, but the direction keeps changing. Okay, some of you have probably heard of the overbanking tendency. And we typically like to say, if, you, if you're working, looks like we got a question, so I'll jump in and answer that first. Okay. Uh, uh, first question here actually is going to relate to what you're getting into right now, Alex, and that is, why exactly does the down aileron create more drag than the up aileron in a turn? Okay. That is a great question. So let's talk about what's going to happen as we roll this aircraft into a turn. And I'm going to use the iPad to show it, even though the aileron's not moving here, apparently the animator... <laughs> didn't bother to do that. Um, let's go ahead and draw this out. So this aileron in this case, I'm gonna use arrows and I'll use blue, is going to deflect down. And this aileron will deflect up. So what's happening to the angle of attack on this aileron? Well, of course, to raise the wing, we're generating more lift. We're increasing the angle of attack. That's the way the aircraft rolls into a bank. And so because we're generating more lift, the aircraft is going to generate more drag on this outside wing. The opposite is happening here on the inside wing. Okay, so this aileron is deflected up. It's got a smaller angle of attack. So if we're going to draw maybe the two angles of attack, you might see something like that. Now that was, give me a second, I'm gonna do a better job of that. Something like that. And something like that. Because this has a smaller angle of attack, it's going to generate less lift. And because it's generating less lift, it's going to generate less induced drag. Okay, so if you think about that, if we were to draw some drag coming off of this, you get a little bit of drag here. And we're gonna get a lot of drag right there. So what does that want to do to the nose? Of course, it's gonna to wanna to pull the nose around in this direction. So when we start to roll into a bank, we're using lift to roll the aircraft that lift generates extra, basically you could look at it as asymmetrical drag. More drag on the raising wing than you have on the lowering wing, and so that wants to pull the nose to the outside of the turn. 
So I said there's a couple things that you can do to fix this, and, and designers will design this into the ailerons of their aircraft. They can either have um, the downward deflecting aileron, maybe it has a little lip that will stick out and generate extra drag to try to even the drag out. You could have differential ailerons where this downward moving aileron only moves a little bit, just a little bit down. So it in increases lift a little bit, but the upward moving aileron, the one that decreases angle of attack moves a lot more, which minimizes the drag differential. You could put spades on the bottom that deflect into the airflow to minimize drag differential. When it comes to aircraft design, Ailerons are a lot more complicated than we think, because if we make them deflect equally up and down and stay perfectly in line with the wing, you're going to end up with a lot of adverse drag, pulling the nose to the outside of the turn. And that means you're going to need a reasonable amount of rudder pressure to keep that nose aligned with the relative wind. So that's one of the reasons when you fly different airplanes, you may notice that the aircraft requires different amounts of rudder pressure as you roll the aircraft into the turn. A Cirrus requires very little rudder pressure to roll itself into the turn, and a Ronca Champ is going to require quite a bit more. And so each airplane is going to feel different. Now, once you get the airplane into the turn, if it's a fairly shallow turn, and the airplane is neutrally very stable, it will just remain in that bank angle, and you'll neutralize your ailerons. Because at that point in time, the airplane will fly around in the bank angle you've set. So as you roll into the turn, you're using the aircraft, to, the ailerons to bank. Once you get to the bank you want, in almost every uh, modern training aircraft, you can literally let go of the ailerons or let go of the stick and the aircraft will hold that bank angle. Those ailerons go back to neutral, which means essentially the drag on both sides of the wing, the downside and the upside is about the same. So really once you're in the turn, you require very little rudder pressure, oftentimes none at all. And so when we think about that, we're really using rudder to, rudder to keep the airplane aligned with the relative wind as the ailerons are creating differential drag, or adverse yaw. But once the aircraft's set up in its bank angle, that rudder is going to go back to neutral. Okay, so there's a few things that can start to change this. So one of those is the overbanking tendency. So let's just imagine that this airplane is turning on a pivot. It's attached to a pole right there. And if you think about what's happening in this case, the speed differential between these wings is going to be very, very different. Okay, if it's attached to a pole, this wing right here is actually gonna have zero airspeed. This wing will be moving significantly faster. And because of that, because this inside wing has zero airspeed, and this one's got a lot more, the outside wing is going to have a lot more lift than the inside wing. And that extra lift on the outside wing means that you're going to generate a rolling motion that pulls the airplane into the turn, and also the extra lift means that you're gonna have some extra drag on that outside wing. Okay, so really when we're turning, we're not turning on a pull. Normally, in a nice shallow turn, even though that inside wing is moving slightly slower than the outside wing, the difference is so small, that speed differential is so small that it really doesn't generate a difference in lift and a difference in drag. But if you ever practice a steep turn, if you work towards any pilot certificate, you've done at least a 45 degree turn, you feel the load factor there, but at the same time, you should notice the overbanking tendency, that increase in lift on the outside wing that tries to roll you into the turn. And so what do you need to do to compensate? You need control deflection away from the turn, to the outside of the turn, to keep that bank angle perfectly steady. So sometimes this surprises people in slow flight because you can still get over banking tendency in slow flight even at very small bank angles. And that's because that over banking tendency depends on the radius of turn, not necessarily the bank angle itself. A very small radius turn is going to generate a lot of speed differential between the two wings. And so there's a couple ways that we can keep the radius of turn small. Number one, we can increase that bank angle, which increases the rate of turn and decreases the radius. But the other thing that we can do is we can slow the airplane down. 
And if we keep the same bank angle and just slow the airplane down, it's going to tighten the radius of turn. So when we like to think about overbanking tendency, if you go back here and, and you look at the iPad, you can see that as you increase the bank, you know, we start to show it growing, but this, the point at which you start to feel this really depends on the airspeed that you're flying. When we're doing a steep turn as a practice maneuver, uh, you're typically going to feel it at your normal, um, not your technical maneuvering speed, but the speed that you'd fly your maneuvers at. So, you know, in this series, maybe 100, 120 knots. But if you slowed that airplane down into slow flight, you would feel that overbanking tendency much earlier. And that sometimes catches people by surprise, especially in something like a traffic pattern, where a base to final turn, the aircraft is typically slower than what you would do a steep turn at, and you can run into some overbanking tendencies if you end up using even a 30 or 40 degree turn. Okay, so to, to just close this up, if you, as you start to experience that speed differential between wings, what you're going to need is to steer the ailerons towards the outside of the turn. That's going to help keep the aircraft. You don't want to roll it out. You just want to keep it right at this bank angle. You're trying to even up those lift vectors. So if you look at that, watch this lift vector right here and the inside one right here. Here's our stick in neutral. As we roll against that overbanking tendency, what we've now done is we've evened out the lift on the wing and the aircraft will remain in a steady state bank. You'll also notice that we need a little bit of rudder now inside the turn. And that's because this wing was generating extra drag from all of that extra induced or that extra lift. We've eliminated that lift with aileron deflection. That's caused some form drag. So essentially, when you get over banking tendency, you're going to run into that same case where that high wing has a little more drag than the low wing. And so typically, you'll need a little bit of rudder pressure towards the inside of the turn. If you look at this, the odd thing is that you feel like the aircraft's cross-controlled, even though it is coordinated. And that's the key. You might be a little bit cross-controlled if you look at the stick. You've got your yoke rolling a little bit to the outside and your rudder pushing a little bit to the inside. But if you had a yaw string, or if you looked at your turn coordinator, you should find that the airplane is still completely coordinated. And the reason it's coordinated is because you're keeping that aircraft's nose aligned with the relative wind. Okay, looks like we've got a question. All right, next question is this. When I start a turn, why does my, my RPM go down, and how much power do I need to add to maintain altitude when I'm doing a turn, or maybe even a steep turn? Okay. That is a great question. Think about what's happening as you roll into a turn and you maintain altitude. You have to increase your angle of attack. So let's go back uh, just a couple slides and take a look at the forces in the turn. The reason you have to increase your angle of attack is because we're generating more and more lift. And so you'll notice the RPM decrease on some uh, fixed pitch propellers. And that it's decreasing because essentially you're loading up that prop just a little bit. And so it, you shouldn't see the change much. Um, in fact, most people will probably never even notice it. But you've got a higher angle of attack. And so you might need to bring in, you'll, you'll need to bring in more power even if you didn't notice the RPM decrease. You'll always need to add power in a turn. And the reason for that is that we're adding lift. And so because we're adding lift, we're always adding drag. Okay, so the question is how much power do you need to add? The answer is it completely depends. I can't tell you. Uh, not only can I not tell you for a specific, uh, for in general for airplanes, but even for a specific airplane, the power change is going to depend on the bank angle or the load factor and also the weight inside the airplane. And so, you know, you and your instructor will need a little different power change than say you in a fully loaded airplane or just you in a solo flight. Um, that's one of the reasons why, especially early on in private pilot training, you just roll into and practice turns. Uh, and the key thing is to roll in and keep that scan pattern quickly outside, then inside around your airspeed, your altitude, turn coordinator, 
and look at that airspeed, you're gonna add enough power to keep that airspeed from decreasing. Once you kind of find the amount of power you need to add, um, changes from that will be fairly minimal. And so it's something that you're gonna gain with experience. But again, the reason you need to add power as you roll into a turn is because you're increasing lift. And because you're increasing lift, you're increasing drag, you need more thrust to compensate. If you see your RPM start to decrease a little bit, it's probably that increased angle of attack in the turn, it's loading up the, the engine, and that's essentially slowing it down just a little bit. Okay, looks like we've got another question. Next up, uh, the question is this, is it possible for you to overbank into a spin? We're gonna talk about this in detail in a second. The overbanking tendency itself would not lead to a spin. It is important to keep in mind though that as we increase our bank angle, we're increasing load factor. We're increasing our angle of attack to get that lift, right? If we go back to this chart, you know, in level flight, as we start to roll into a bank, our total lift needs to increase because we need to generate this horizontal component of lift. And the only way we're gonna do that, keeping a constant airspeed, is to increase angle of attack. So we're getting closer and closer to our stalling speed. And we're getting closer and closer to our stalling critical angle of attack. That's the right way to look at it. Our stall speed as we roll into a turn is going to increase. So let's take a look and see what that looks like. This is a stall speed versus bank angle chart. Um, and when you think of stall speeds versus bank angle, this is assuming that we're maintaining altitude in coordinated flight and we're loading up the airplane. And you can see right about maybe 45 degrees of bank, we end up with roughly a 20% increase in stall speed. Roughly 60 degrees of bank, we end up with about a 40% increase in stall speed. And I would say maybe about 65 degrees of bank, our stall speed increases by 50%. But there's another way to look at this, and I think it makes it a little bit more clear. And that is, it's really not the angle of bank that's important, it's the load factor. Stall speed increases in proportion to the square root of the load factor, okay? So in a 2G turn, the square root of two is 1.41, about a 40% increase. At a 60 degree bank, stall speed increases 41%. So, Let's take a look at a slip and a skid because that's where I think stall speed really um, and, and spins really start to show up. And, and that is in a coordinated turn, the relative wind is pointed right down the aircraft's nose. But as we start to talk about skids and slips, that relative wind starts to move. And a great way to look at this is to look at the airplane from behind. So here we're moving the aircraft now into a skid and you can see that if the relative wind was coming right straight in front of us, the nose is pointed inside of it. The relative wind might become, would be coming you know, from right here, okay? And the nose is pointed inside of it. If you look at your turn indicator, you'll notice as we roll into, or as, as the aircraft enters a skid, the turn rate actually will increase. Now one way to think of a skid is to think about this. In a skid, the airplane is turning too fast for its bank angle. It's your bank too much, or sorry, you're, you're, you're turning too much and you need to increase your bank. Now, the interesting thing is the airplane will actually do this for you. The airplane is gonna try to fix itself and re-coordinate the turn because the airplane's designed to be stable and it's designed to be flown into the relative wind. So how do we get into a skid? Well, the most common reason we get into a skid is because we want to increase our turn rate, especially that base to final turn. We're trying to get the airplane in line with the runway and not overshoot, and we start to cheat by pushing on the rudder. And there's a couple reasons that we'll cheat by pushing on the rudder. One of which is some people are told never bank more than 30 degrees in the traffic pattern. That's not an official rule. Um, I can tell you in the SR-22, at 100 knots, uh, especially if I'm in a tight pattern with other aircraft and I wanna stay in tro, I'm definitely banking a little more than 30 degrees in the traffic pattern, but it keeps me in line with other aircraft, which I think is very important. So, you know, some people will artificially limit their bank angle in a traffic pattern. And so, as opposed to, you know, keeping the airplane coordinated on a base to final turn that maybe started a little bit late 
And as opposed to increasing the bank angle, what they'll do is they'll lean on that inside rudder, which tends to pull the nose around. This oftentimes does not happen intentionally because we just kind of learn that we can control that nose with the rudder. And so we start to push that left rudder in. If we're making a left turn, that swings the left nose in. If you go back to the iPad, you can see essentially that's what's happening here. Our nose is pulled into the turn, okay? And so what essentially, if you look at your turn coordinator, what it's saying is step on the opposite ball, re-coordinate it, get that nose back in line with the relative wind. The other thing, if you were to hold that in and let go of the ailerons, that yaw that you're experiencing towards the inside of the turn is accelerating the aero, airflow over this wing. This wing is moving faster. And so because of that, if you step on that left rudder, you notice as the airplane will actually start to bank itself a little more. So if you release your aileron pressure, the airplane will actually try to re-coordinate itself. And that's one of the things to keep in mind. We talk about skids and we talk about slips. They're being held into place by the pilot because the airplane, if you let go of one of those two controls, would essentially try to coordinate itself. It's us that's doing this. Okay, slip is the opposite case. Let's take a look at what's happening there. So let's take it from the skid where the nose is pointed to the inside of the turn. We're turning too fast. In a slip, the nose is pointed towards the outside of the turn. And so now we're turning too slowly. You can see the turn rate has decreased. The ball is on the inside, and if you actually look at the load factor here pulling down, that makes sense. Load factor should be here, but it's swung a little bit towards the inside of the turn. The ball should have been here, but it swung a little bit towards the inside of the turn as well. That is a slip. And the most exaggerated uh, version of that would be a forward slip, which we could do to landing, where the aircraft is in a bank angle and not turning at all. We use that to generate drag to help uh, increase our rate of descent and keep our airspeed slow. Uh, in fact, I think we did another live, one of our first lives was on uh, forward slips. We did, yeah. So again, a slip can be an entirely intentional maneuver and keep the airplane at a bank angle and not let it turn at all. So that brings up the question, what's worse, a skid or a slip? And the answer is skidding is really never appropriate, ever. So a skid is worse and a slip, if it's done intentionally, is a way to generate drag, increasing your rate of descent without increasing your airspeed is an appropriate maneuver. And so because of that, if you look at them, uh, part of that relates to the fact that they have different stall patterns. So let's take a look at a skidding turn. So this is a skidding turn here. You can see our rate of turn is too fast. The nose is pointed inside of the flight path. And you'll notice that we actually have to hold the airplane um, in a skidding turn. Look at our control deflections here. Again, the airplane wants to re-coordinate itself, but to hold it in a skidding turn, we have up aileron. We're reducing the angle of attack on the up wing, and we have down aileron increasing the angle of attack on the down wing. That's the only way we can keep this airplane in this maneuver because otherwise the airplane would immediately try to roll itself back into the turn. Okay, and you can see by looking at the rudder, essentially that rudder is deflected. That's what's holding the nose onto the inside of the turn. It's flying the nose into the turn and out of alignment with the relative wind. Okay, so let's look at this overhead and let's see what's happening to the airflow. What you can see is on the outside wing, we have fairly clean and aligned, re uh, clean relative wind. On the inside wing, the airflow is blanketed by the fuselage. And I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Let's take a look and see what happens when this enters a stall. So let's start by looking at a coordinated stall in a turn. Notice our ailerons are essentially neutral here because once we've entered a coordinated turn and the bank angle is established, your ailerons and your rudder are basically going to be neutral. As the aircraft starts to stall and approach the critical angle of attack, the aircraft should remain in a steady bank angle. And what you'll notice is the stall pattern on the wings will be very even. So if this is the stalled area, it's going to remain very even. 
And so when the aircraft breaks, it's essentially going to remain coordinated. Now let's take a look at that skid. Okay, again, you can see we've got the rudder holding the nose to the inside of the turn. Okay, the rudder is what's increasing our turn rate. We've got up aileron on our outside wing, preventing the aircraft from rolling further in. We've got down aileron on the inside wing. Okay, that's trying to keep this wing up, again, preventing the aircraft from rolling into the turn and coordinating itself. So if we look at that angle of attack here, you're gonna have a fairly high angle of attack here. You're gonna have a much lower angle of attack here. So as the aircraft starts to pitch up, how are those stall patterns gonna change? Well, they're gonna look something like this. Because this inside wing is at a high angle of attack, you're gonna notice that this wing is significantly more stalled than the outside wing. The stall patterns aren't even remotely even. And so as the aircraft exceeds the critical angle of attack, it's going to roll into the turn, essentially rolling itself into a spin. And this can be very, very abrupt. So we talk about this base to final skidding turn, where you're using the rudder to pull that nose around to line up with the runway. What people don't always realize is when that aircraft starts to stall, that inside wing is at a much higher angle of attack. Even though it's lower, it's below the pilot, it's at a much higher angle of attack. It's much closer to its critical angle of attack. And so it's going to stall first, it's going to drop, and you're gonna roll the aircraft into a spin because you're uncoordinated. And that'll happen quickly. And then the other thing that compounds that is that this is an accelerated stall because the load factor is increased on the airplane. So you're going to stall much faster than you would in normal 1G level flight. And the other thing to consider is as you accelerate a stall, as you stall with more Gs, the stall becomes more abrupt. And so now you've got this combination of a much more abrupt stall and your low wing is the one that's got the larger stall pattern. So you're gonna have an abrupt stall with a quick roll in towards that low wing. Okay, now let's take a look at the slipping turn. Okay, and I said, a slip is a normal flight maneuver. And what we've got right now is an in unintentionally done slip. Okay, so this would not be considered normal, but you could slip straight ahead and you slip in a crosswind landing. Those are normal flight maneuvers. So what makes a slipping turn more safe? Well, first of all, let's take a look at our control deflections. In this case, we're using the rudder here to keep the nose outside of the turn to decrease the rate of turn, okay? That would try to roll the airplane towards level, but we're opposing that. We've got down aileron on this up wing, okay? So that's increasing the angle of attack up here, right? We've got a fairly, let me, fairly high angle of attack on this outside wing. And if we look at the inside wing, that's an up aileron. And so we've got a much lower angle of attack. So which wing's going to stall first? Obviously, the high wing. If you look at it from an overhead side, we also get that blanketing effect from the fuselage. So the low wing has clean airflow. And the high wing, the outside wing, that's got that blanketed airflow from the fuselage. So when we look at the stall in this case, let's take a look. As the aircraft starts to increase angle of attack, what's our stall pattern look like? Okay, again, this aileron's deflected down. So it's, I drew that wrong, I'm gonna do that again. At a higher angle of attack, the inside aileron is deflected up, lowering the angle of attack on the wing. The stall pattern This outside wing is much more stalled than the inside wing. So as the aircraft stalls, it's going to roll itself towards level. Now, if you kept the slip control in, it would enter a spin, but it's going to roll through level and then down towards what was once your high wing. And so when we talk about 
a skid, okay, where you're turning too fast, the nose is on the inside, you're turning with rudder as opposed to keeping the aircraft turned, that skid is very abrupt and immediately you roll down into a spin, whereas a slip, you're gonna notice the aircraft tries to essentially level itself out. And if you simply let go of the controls, the aircraft will recover essentially in a level stall. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, next up here from James. Uh, he wants to go back to the overbanking tendency, and he says this. With overbanking, is this where, if you're not careful, you can get yourself into a cross-controlled stall? That's a great question. It's actually not overbanking that leads to a cross-controlled stall. It's the skidding turn that leads to a cross-controlled stall. Overbanking tendency is not going to generate enough aileron and rudder pressure that we, you, know, you really would end up in a um, cross-controlled stall. It's, it's the, the, the pressures required to keep the aircraft from rolling in on itself are generally fairly light. Okay. The other thing that you to think about is typically when we're flying um, in this kind of a maneuver, it's a high speed, um, you're, you're not very uncoordinated, uh, and you're fairly far away from your stalling speed. It's the skidding turn. That's the one that leads to a cross-coordinated stall. And so I'm going to go back to that skidding turn here. Okay. We're going to rewind back to the beginning on it. Okay, if we look at this, the aircraft's turn coordinator isn't going to be, um, I'm going to draw a, a, draw a poor looking ball here, but we'll make this work. Colin, what do you think of that? <laughs> It'll pass for now. Okay, so <laughs> let's say that is the center, okay? In this case, okay, switching colors. The ball is going to be over here. It's on the right. Okay. And if you think about it, what do we have? We've got a whole bunch of left rudder. So I'm going to write that out here. We got lots of left rudder keeping the aircraft into the turn. Now let's take a look at our ailerons. This aileron right here is deflected down. So if you were to think about this, the yoke is going to be turned to the right. So I'm going to draw a yoke. And if we were to think about it, it's going to look something like that. If that's your yoke, it's not straight. It's turned to the right. That's what we call a cross controlled stall. That's the most common variety. And what will happen is, as the aircraft goes through the turn, you could continue to increase that rudder deflection. And to counter the aircraft rolling in, you're going to have to continue to roll the bank even more towards the outside. So you end up with, in this case, lots and lots of right rudder or left rudder with lots and lots of right aileron. That's how you roll into that cross-controlled stall. And so when we talk about that again, the most common cross-controlled stall is going to happen base to final. And that's simply because it's almost always the fact that we're trying to make that turn to line up with the runway and we're overshooting. And the key thing to remember is, A, you want to limit your bank angle to a safe bank angle. You don't want to end up in a 50 degree or a 45 degree turn on low, at low altitude and short final. But the other thing is, you can never uncoordinate the airplane to cheat on that turn. If you can't get that turn lined up with the runway, it's safer to overshoot than it is to try to uncoordinate the airplane and skid around into the turn. Okay, so what would happen if you're in an airport like Metro that has two parallel runways and you realize, oh man, I, I'm going to overshoot? Well, the answer is tell ATC right away that you need to overshoot your turn and keep the aircraft coordinated and fly through. You know, avoid traffic, obviously, let them know what you need to do, but at the same time, never cheat your way through that base to final turn because that can end up in that abrupt cross-controlled stall. Okay, next question. Okay, we got time for one last question here, and we will, we do have a few more questions. We'll try to hit those in the chat as we're wrapping up. Uh, but the last question is this. Marcus wants to know if you can just walk us all through adverse yaw in a turn one more time. 
Okay, that is a great question. So let's go through, um, I'm gonna go back into this guy right here. We're gonna talk about how the aircraft rolls into a bank for adverse yaw. Okay, as the aircraft starts to roll, and that's where you notice the adverse yaw. It's not when the aircraft stops and holds a bank. It's while the aircraft is rolling. How do we get the aircraft to roll? Well, in this case, what we need to do is deflect the ailerons because the ailerons are essentially unbalancing lift. To get the airplane to roll, we want a lot of lift on the outside wing, and we want only a little lift on the inside wing. So what does that mean the aileron's gonna do? Well, if you look at this aileron, to get that lift, it's gonna increase the angle of attack, so it's going to deflect down. And the inside wing, you wanna decrease the amount of lift. We're not generating negative lift, we're just creating a little bit of an imbalance. So we're gonna decrease that lift, that means that we're reducing the angle of attack, and so that aileron's going to deflect up. So if we look at the angles of attack here, okay, we've got a very small angle of attack on the inside, we've got a larger angle of attack on the outside. And that means that we're gonna run into a difference in, in, in lift, and therefore always if you, if you create more lift, you also create more drag. Okay, so this one right here is gonna generate lots more drag than this guy right here, just a little bit of drag. Okay, so if you think about that drag and what that wants to do, essentially that drag is gonna start pulling on this wing more than it pulls on this wing. And that's gonna pull the nose to the outside of the turn. And so that's why adverse yaw always wants to pull the nose away from the turn because that down aileron on the outside wing is increasing your angle of attack so that you can generate unbalanced and extra lift to roll the airplane. And that increase in angle of attack, the increase in lift means an increase in drag, pulling the nose away from the turn. And the way you're going to fix this is to use your rudder, okay, to fly the nose back into the turn and line it up with the relative wind. That is essentially adverse yaw. And again, we try to neutralize some of this with aileron design, but at the end of the day, you need a little bit of rudder pressure in some airplanes and a lot of rudder pressure in others. And that pressure is going to change with your airspeed. You know, you'll notice different pressures when you're flying slow and fast. Okay, that's all the time we've got for tonight. Um, our next presentation, which will start at the top of the hour, is RNAV procedures. So if you're an instrument rated pilot or if you're thinking about getting your instrument rating, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we used to call a GPS approach. Now they're called RNAV approach procedures. We're gonna talk about the differences and the different kinds of minima and how they're flown a little differently. And this is you know, kind of focused on the pilot side. So how you would use each of the different types of minima and what would happen if your GPS receiver had a failure and had to downgrade. Uh, so that'll be our IFR Live starts at the top of the hour. And then at Oshkosh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we have three presentations. All three of them are starting at 1245. They're in the EAA Pilot Proficiency Tent. They're 100% free. Uh, so please come on down. We'd love to see you. Uh, we'll be at Oshkosh the entire week. We don't have a booth, but we wander around. Um, so if you see us, please stop by and say hi. Okay, hope to see you in IFR, but otherwise, hope to see you at Oshkosh or live in a couple weeks. Good night.